Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us at Campus Compact for this afternoon's coalition conversation. We are very fortunate to have Becca, the Executive Director of Living Room Conversations here to talk with us about how a how to a to talk about how an easy to use dialogue to, tool is enhancing learning and fostering belonging in the classroom campuses and beyond. So without further ado, I want to go ahead and turn it over to Becca, who is going to get us started and um, introduce some other folks to us. Becca, it is all yours. So excited to be with all of you this afternoon um, and share a little bit about what we've been learning and have a discussion around what sort of challenges you're currently facing or seeing on campus and how this tool might be um, a good thing to implement uh, in a variety of different ways. And alongside me, I have Amber, Amber Franklin from Miami University of Ohio. And so she'll, she'll share a little bit about what they've been doing on campus, as well as Catherine Despain from um, California State University los angeles so they will jump in um if you have questions throughout feel free to drop them in the chat we'll also have kind of some built-in time for questions as well and i'm going to go ahead and get us started by giving you sort of a overview of the tool that we'll be referencing throughout as well as the organization so living room conversation started in 2010 with the idea that in order to address issues that face us, we need to be in better relationship with each other. And so we took best practices from family mediation as well as dialogue to create a tool that could be massively accessible and scalable, essentially bringing dialogue to the masses. So we have a library of over 160 conversation topics um, and they're all free and free to use. And so there's a really low bar to entry. They're written in a way that they can be self-facilitated. So you don't necessarily need to be a trained moderator or facilitator. Although that we've, we've found that often, uh, especially in a campus setting or when there's programming being created, um, it helps to have a workshop to train people to build confidence in the model and in the ability to host, as we, we call them, we call our facilitators and moderators hosts. So the idea is I'm welcoming you into my living room. I want all my guests to feel welcome. So we maintain a small group size, four to six people, um, and try to keep that, that intimacy that helps to foster belonging and understanding. The format equalizes power dynamics. There are timed portions throughout, so everyone will have the same two minutes to answer a question and then open it back up. The questions all focus on personal experience rather than opinion. Uh, it's that, that narrative sharing, that story sharing that helps not only for really deep self-reflection, like, oh, where do my ideas on this topic come from, but also makes it easier for people to relate to each other because it's grounded in storytelling. We use shared norms or agreements that not only create a container for the conversation, but also sort of spotlight the skills people are actively practicing throughout the conversation. Uh, their positive reactions, and they build those short bridges first. So if we if we look at sort of these chasms of division that we see right now playing out in the news and in society, these help to build these short interpersonal bridges first that can then lead to building those longer bridges. The format, um, here's a little bit more in depth of what we have and why we have it there. You'll see on the left is the, the backside. We try to make it so that when you print it off, it's a front and back. So um, we have kind of bare bones um, guidance throughout. The italicized language is the hosting language that hosts can just read. We start with conversation agreements that we'll look at together a little bit later. Um, an example is be curious and listen to understand. Conversation is as much about listening as it is about talking. You might enjoy exploring how others' experiences have shaped their values and perspectives. So we're not just giving a ground rule 
we're framing them as agreement agreements and then we're giving a little bit of a snapshot of what does this actually look like in practice um instead of just saying be curious and listen to understand and have people interpret it however they want so we always add a little bit of a description some of the other skills that are included in our agreements are curiosity empathy appreciating differences being authentic looking for common ground appreciating differences um, are all part of the conversation agreements which you don't see here that are on page one uh, and then we have three different question rounds. The first one is around shared values. Research shows that when we can connect across shared values, we're more likely to humanize each other and it sets like a really beautiful uh, introduction or foundation for dialogue and for a conversation across differences. Then we have topic questions. So you'll see here on the guide, this um, there's an introductory paragraph that precedes the questions. Here we try to make sure that we have balanced views. So we are after this kind of value sharing, what would your best friend say about you kind of questions, then we're turning to the topic. So um, we always work hard to make sure that we're um, not using polarized language or that we're making sure that we're representing multiple perspectives and viewpoints. And then the questions are those that um, really target personal experience. So you'll see one of the examples on the right here is from our trust and elections conversation. One of the questions from this encountering controversial ideas in higher education be something like, has there been a time when you didn't feel comfortable sharing your perspective or asking a question that was on your mind in a learning setting? What did you do? So not, not as much of this uh, more maybe academic or theoretical, like what is the role of higher ed? What are the things that we should be accomplishing? But what does it actually look like in your life? When do you feel uncomfortable speaking up and why is that? Uh, and then the round three questions are reflection questions. And here we're targeting those that are more action oriented, those that like to sit in their feelings, those that have new thoughts and are more thinkers to make sure everyone feels as though they can answer the question. And that's really the the driving force behind the design and format of the guide is to open as many doors to the conversation as possible so anyone feels like they're able to to respond to participate to answer the questions this is a great it's a it's a better way to engage when things are hot so here are some examples of hot topic issues along with questions so you can kind of see how we're approaching them um, there is certainly a place in the world and in the public sphere for debate and for um, fact based conversations. Uh, what we're trying to do is is offer a different way of, you know, how do we understand how specific topics are impacting the lives of people around us um, and the people that we're that we're in, engaged with. And and I think that this is particularly important where you have sort of like a more closed environment, like a classroom or a campus where there's your own culture that you're trying to cultivate their thing. You have to be able to work together to some extent to, to achieve the mission that you have and the goals that you have in your institution. Um, and so approaching it this way or allowing for this sort of forum where people can use dialogue to connect and understand the issue in a more um, human centered way can be really um, impactful. We're also, you know, in the midst of the epidemic of loneliness, as the US Surgeon General said, and so this is another way to kind of um, counter isolation with this feeling of being seen and heard. And so these are some examples of, you know, places where people may feel as though they're an outlier. Um, and these guides can be used as a way to bring people back together and create those sorts of connections. So we're going to pause real quick because I've been talking for a minute and we are going to test out how well I can seamlessly transition into a Mentimeter poll. So we're going to see how, how well I do this <laughs> and present. You'll see a QR code that pops up and you can scan that. There's also a URL and a code that you can enter if you'd like to join via desktop. So once you scan the QR code, you'll just get a thumbs up. It shows you you're in the right place and we'll wait for some people to join before launching the poll.
And again, you can also do the menti.com with that specific code and it'll bring you to the same place. And the first question is going to be a um, kind of an open-ended question for what are the challenges and trends you're seeing on campus or in the classroom. So I'm going to move to launch the poll. You'll still see the website as well as the code on the top of the slide. So if you're not in there yet, you still have a chance to get in there. And I think it allows you more than one response. Um, so you just type that in and then we'll start seeing people's responses pop up on the screen. We're seeing some fatigue, some lack of time for deep conversations, some polarization, um, challenges to feeling connected in a team setting, um, connecting just in person outside of the digital sphere, some fear from students, faculty, and admins, some tension, um, again, lack of time for these bigger questions, um, a fear of speaking up, the inability to engage in productive discussion around polarizing issues, lack of tolerance, some anxiety, people not opting into the conversations, people avoiding them. Um, we had one program on campus where the we asked our student leaders, what are the conversations people are avoiding on campus? <laughs> That's what we used to kind of create the, the um, program around because we all have conversations we think we're, we're avoiding or we wish we could have. Um, general fear to be your authentic self, fear from faculty, student disengagement. <clears throat> Folks are feeling nervous to express their true feelings because of, um, PR and fear. State legislators are watching closely. Things are happening on campuses, like dissolving DEI programs, other things like that. Um, giving grace when talking about polarizing issues. A lot of compounding events that have been affecting campuses. A lack of empathy or vulnerability. Technology again, loneliness, overwhelm, distrust of administration, uh, and polarizing student groups egging each other on. Those aren't small things <laughs> that are happening on campus and in the classroom. Uh, and hopefully during our time together here, we'll be able to equip you with at least one other tool um, that could help to address some of these challenges and trends and, and offer a, a good way to engage. Um, now we're getting to one of my favorite questions. So what are those conversations you're avoiding or you would like to have on campus? What are some of these hot button issues or things that, that you see a need for conversation around? And this one's a word cloud. So if you see the same issue more than once, it's gonna be bigger, it's gonna be pretty different colors and all of that. Right off the bat, we've got voting, abortion, and gun control. Gun control. So that's, those are some <laughs> ubiquitous ones. Redlining and gerrymandering. The election, electoral politics, race. Respect, generational differences. DEIB, genocide, police, disability, interfaith, social justice misinformation, unsanitized history, the value of higher ed itself, <laughs> democratic values, gentrification, LGBTQ issues, community, listening to understand climate justice, public pur purpose higher ed. conversations about resources. So you kind of see the, the larger ones coming through, interfaith voting, reproductive rights, and gun control with a whole variety of other um, topics uh, in the mix as well. 
Oh, we just got some new ones. Gender rights. I think that was one of the new ones that popped up. Uh, and I'm I'm happy to share this with Laura <clears throat> afterwards. So if if you're interested, if you want to remember, like what were the issues that all of my colleagues said that they wanted to talk about, um, I'll make sure that she gets uh, these so that you can you can keep them. Um, I always find it immensely helpful to hear what other people are thinking about or worried about. It makes me feel a little better that I'm thinking about and worrying about the same things. So um, I'll, I'll happily share that. Now we're going to get back to the slides real quick. And um, we asked, you know, we, we gather our higher ed practitioners of living room conversations. We try to gather quarterly and we ask them questions like this. What are, what are you seeing? What are the challenges? And these were some of the challenges that were articulated by those in the group. I believe Amber was on this call, even as we <laughs> articulated some of this student self-censorship is certainly something that you mentioned in the word cloud, political correctness and lines drawn in the sound sand around difficult topics that make them difficult to discuss, the inability of students being able to talk to each other, um, this cross-disciplinary problem of being in conversation you disagree with and not having it be centered in conflict, and then all of the post-COVID challenges with mental health and feelings of isolation. Um, one of our, this is just a quote from one of our higher ed practitioners who was feeling this frustration um, around racial unrest and just not understanding how we couldn't have these conversations that we're so deeply meeting without blowing up or defending ourselves um, and said that she just in crap in crap she just scrapped her entire um, composition curriculum to rebuild it around living room conversations where it was sort of this idea that yeah we need to be writing but we also need to be listening to each other so that we're better writings and have better understanding and, and have um, and more uh, connection as well. So uh, the same group of uh, higher ed folks across universities and, and colleges across the country asked sort of like, what is the hope or what is the opportunity here? Um, very much empowering students in their own voices, uh, allowing them to play with ideas without feeling threatened or not wanting to speak up. Um, this idea of approaching with a learning mindset, <laughs> open minds uh, to be able to increase learning. There's a, certainly a skill building component built within the structure of this as you're practicing these core bridge building skills, uh, leadership development as you can hand it off to student leaders to hold their own conversations or as Kat may um, talk about, write their own conversation guides around topics that are important to them. Um, we have worked with higher ed uh, folks who have used this for research and have published it in academic journals, um, shifts in campus culture and the larger community, and just raising awareness in a different way around issues. Um, and then on the right, you'll see we had an 18 month study done by Fetzer Institute that found both immediate and long, longer term impact. Um, and then we looked at our communities of practice, so those who have been using our resources regularly, like monthly conversations, um, where you see that it can help to be generate a baseline of trust that fosters cohesion, especially across difference, and allows for this culture of listening, respect, and friendship. And I think, you know, looking at the challenges that you're and trends you're seeing on campus, as well as the conversations you want to be having, this sort of baseline of trust and this culture of listening and respect um, is really critical to alleviating some of those um, concerns and challenges. Um, these are, this is just feedback from people who have participated in conversations. Um, overwhelmingly, these are, these are all students. Um, so, you know, you mentioned talking in person rather than online. So you'll see this quote around social media um, or how the questions are based on personal experiences and why a person thought the things that they did um, and kind of this desire to see more of that in classes. 
uh, rather than opinions and political beliefs or this idea that someone's trying to convince you of something um, in, in the learning space. Uh, and then, you know, even the opportunity, I'll get into it really quick. I'm going to do a series of really fast rapid fire snapshots and then turn the time over to Amber and Kat to do a little more in-depth snapshots where you can ask questions as well. But there are so many different ways it can be applied on campus. Um, we've mentioned curriculum. Um, you'll see here a quote from a student talking about like this could be coordinated with clubs or different departments so that we can kind of pull on the rich resources that are available in higher ed to create you know, a more diverse conversation or engaging different parts of campus. So um, the, the one that I mentioned where we asked students <laughs> sort of what are the conversations you're avoiding on campus or you feel like are being avoided on campus, what would you really like to talk about came through a public health department and they ended up um, with mental health, public health, race and faith communities as overwhelmingly those that were being avoided or needed to be addressed on campus. There were um, uh, 16 different student leaders who were trained in using the model and generated 36 conversations over a semester of work. They um, approached it as a research project. We were funded, we got joint funding from Heterodox Academy to look at um, dialogue within public health. And um, there's a fun little video. Again, I can send this slide deck out as well so you can click on the link and see the fun little video testimonial. Um, but I, I loved this quote in that it's not, it's not just what you're doing in the classroom that will affect campus and classroom, but this idea that um, it opened a huge, like long, late into the night conversation with a roommate who brought up experiences I didn't know she had. So you're acquiring life skills when you're able to engage um, in dialogue. NC State University um, created a campus conversations project where, and this, this, these stats were from last year, so more conversations have happened um, and more student leaders have been trained. They partnered with a sort of honors um, student scholar service fellow program. So they have kind of a regenerating pool of student hosts as there are people who have been awarded this fellowship. Um, they've connected with almost 2000 students. <laughs> um, they've made this a resource for people on campus uh, in different departments. And then they've also started rolling it into their student um, housing, um, student life um, as a way to kind of expose incoming freshmen to these kinds of skills and dialogue. Um, Casper College is a small university in Wyoming. Um, the conversation agreements have become part of classroom culture. So this is an example of it being brought into a specific curriculum and course. They um, have five main themes for the class and then use the living room conversations to spark conversation. And then um, it's the, the writing composition 1010 class. So then they're writing about it, but they're informed by the experiences of their peers. And I will turn it over to Catherine. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Catherine. You can call me Cat for short. Um, I'm a former student of uh, Sean L. Curry, Professor uh, Sean L. Curry. She's also the founder and CEO of a charitable organization company called uh, Media Done Responsibly, which is uh, has the goal to train people from any students coming in that could help the generation coming, you know, up. Uh, where they're able to approach these types of like possibly polarizing topics or, you know, difficult conversations or that um, to help like uplift communities that have maybe historically been on the margins and, you know, or um, everything that uh, connects us and is, and is important, but is kind of stigmatized and difficult to discuss uh, with even a loved one, you know, let alone be someone you're not very in connection with or new to meeting like a classmate or peer. So um, whether that be men mental health or, or, you know, community resources and, and just, it was a way um, 
uh, the way that I was introduced uh, to the, the LRC model was through um, Professor Curry's media studies classes I took from her. And um, she used the LRC model as a guide for her, what she calls cafe conversations, which we would have, we had some in person, but the majority of them was uh, when I was participating, um, when I first started her classes was online in the virtual classroom setting during the height of the pandemic. And um, I'm a student uh, that uh, has some physical disabilities and, um, so for it to be accessible to me um, and for me to like, it kind of highlighted the um, intersections of who I am where my, you know, I confronted how my disabilities and my challenges um, are not something that has to hold me back. I can still, you know, access um, a community in this new um, setting to me, new to me online and represent, um, you know, parts of myself by sharing my unique experiences, being guided by the LRC MDR model, because, you know, the way they started things was with a, um, a guide letting us know that this was a space for all of us to have conversations about things we may know about, but want to learn more about. And we could come together and give each other the mutual respect and time uh, to have our thoughts shared, to ask questions that are needed, and and that it would be a place where everyone treated each other like they deserve to be treated. And um, whereas maybe if it wasn't guided in that way in the past, we we didn't have that experience. So. Um, I really was impressed with the first time I participated and I just continue to look forward to it um, every time she shared the opportunity, whether it be um, related to our class or if it was just for um, the public as a whole, because they also welcome people from the community to join us if they'd like to. And um, so I'm honored to be here today to like um, speak to all of you or answer any questions you have, um, if I could help um, anyone um, spread the word about this. And, you know, as Becca shared, like it's a, it's free, it's, it's, um, it's really invaluable, like it, the, you know, and I, I would like it, everyone to give it a try. And so thank you for including me today. And if there's anything else I can add, please let me know. I just, um, I did have, you know, some questions that um, I wanted to answer and I have them written down, but I, I just, you know, I'm pretty much giving that from just, you know, my heart now and the best I can, <laughs> but, um, if I left anything out, please let me know and I will reference my notes. <laughs> that was, that was great. And, and as you can see, one of the really interesting things that this program did was partner with a community nonprofit. And so, you know, earlier, like pre-COVID, they even had these student guides that were created by students. They would take them to the secondary schools and then engage the secondary school students in a conversation that they had created based on this media studies class. So talking about these different aspects of, of identity and how they're represented in, in media. So I love, you know, this really unique uh, application of the model. Um, and... Kat wrote a couple great guides as well. Um, and so yeah. I think we'll hear from Amber and then we'll come back. And if you have questions for um, Kat or Amber, or if you have questions where I know of some other things that we've done on campus, I may jump in and, and ask those. And then we'll have a chance to actually practice. So that's, the, that's after we kind of think about like, oh, these are all the different ways it's been used. Then you'll get to practice it. And then we'll come back and sort of debrief and look at how, how you may want to apply them um, on campus. So I will kind of forward this and hand it over to Amber. All right, I really appreciate being here today. My name's Amber Franklin. I'm an associate professor of speech pathology and audiology at Miami University of Ohio. And um, I wear several different hats in my community and I'll, I'll start by letting you know um, how I started in with uh, living room conversations. It was actually where I discovered it in the summer of 2020. 
And I discovered the LRC model because I was a member of um, Oxford's Police Community Relations and Review Commission, um, a founding member of that commission. And so I can, you can imagine in the summer of 2020, all of a sudden, this little town that had a police commission that meets four times a year, and sometimes the meetings would get a little bit tense, but sometimes they were pretty sleepy. All of a sudden, we became the center of attention. And because everyone was at home and on Zoom, people were able to attend the police commission meetings in numbers we hadn't seen before um, in response to the murder of George Floyd. And um, after a rally uptown, I had a conversation with one of our lieutenants, and he was telling me about a scenario and asked me the question, um, how basically, how can we get, how can we start talking about this? And I didn't know that LRC existed at the time. I thought I was going to need to develop my own guide or create something from scratch. But I did some searching on the internet and I found living room conversations and found that they had a dialogue already on police community relations. And um, so that was the beginning of it. Um, and in the fall of 2020, uh, as a result of a, something that I published um, in our speech pathology professional magazine, I started getting asked to do presentations on race-based disparities. And I decided to include short living room conversations um, about race in those presentations. So I present, and then I would give the attendees an opportunity to engage in an LRC. But um, the more formal use of LRC came in my department. It was actually, I think, in January of 2021. Um, I wrote a grant with a colleague of mine to get some funding to have our students trained as um, hosts to conduct living room conversations. Um, and that's when I first got in touch, I think, with Becca and some of the presentations that you all were doing. Um, and this was one based on um, race health based, uh, sorry, race based health disparities. Um, and it was in our department, it was all speech language pathology students. Um, our field is predominantly white, predominantly female, predominantly middle class, but the population that we serve is very diverse. And many of our students um, didn't have the opportunity, especially here at Miami University, we're in a small town, didn't have many friends of color, hadn't had, I was their first professor or teacher of color. And so I found that they really wanted an opportunity to have these conversations in a safe and supportive environment. So um, our Center for Career Exploration and Success. So if you have a career center and they um, are offering funding for grant opportunities, we were able to get funded through our career center. And uh, we did it by writing about this skill as a um, professional skill, being able to have conversations about race around differences in ways that build bridges as something that's necessary to be an effective clinician in speech pathology or any number of fields. Um, we got the funding and with that funding, we were able to train 15 students. They met with Becca and her team twice. The first was a training on the model of living room conversations broadly. Um, and I think that was maybe an hour and a half. And then the second training was a couple weeks later and in which they participated in a living room conversation. And I'll say that my colleague and I were not part of, of either of those trainings. I mean, we, we sat in on the beginning of the first one, but we really wanted our students to communicate um, with Becca and Brielle, I think it was Brielle at the time, without feeling like we were um, taking notes or judging them, you've seen in the word cloud, like some of the things that students are concerned about. Um, and so what we did is they, they got their training and then we paired the students up. And in each pair, each student had to find two peers to invite to a living room conversation about race. So we were able to extend um, the benefit of the training. So we had 15 students in groups of two or three, mostly two. And then in each group of two, four additional students were invited to do a living room conversation about race. Um, there were also readings and reflections that students had to do in a Canvas course that we created. Um, and we um, took data at the end of that. And I'll, I'll report on a little bit of the data. 
Um, we asked the students, so these were some of the prompts and there were, was like a 10 point agreement scale. Um, I would recommend this training to another student. The average for that was 9.33. So one being strongly disagree, 10 being strongly agree. Um, the LRC training and facilitation helped improve my confidence in talking about race. The average for that was 8.33. How likely are you to independently host another living room conversation? Average was um, seven. And um, I learned a great deal about race and ethnicity through the living room conversation training. The average was 7.67. .67. So it was really positive um, training. Um, our students really do desire these opportunities to communicate, but they wanna know that they can do it in a safe and non-judgmental space. Um, you have to be comfortable with silence in the beginning uh, and even awkward silence. But I do find that as students start communicating, it a dam breaks at some point and students recognize that they they can talk to each other. Um, and it's, it's great for helping students explore challenging topics. Since then, um, I've run for city council, so I'm also a city councilor in Oxford. I've used living room conversations to talk about abortion. Thank you to talk about abortion, to talk about marijuana legalization, like all things that have been going on in Ohio. Um, and people have come to our interfaith center to have those conversations. Our police chief hosted a small conversation in his backyard about police community relations, which was wonderful. Um, and now in a few weeks, Becca is doing a training through our interfaith center to talk about conversations in troubling times. Um, additionally, our residence life campus has been doing um, opportunities for faculty and students to engage in residence halls. And so when I engage with students, when I'm asked to engage, I do a living room conversation. So I've done one on civic renewal. I've done one on cancel culture. I've also done, done some with our Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, which has now been changed to the Office of Transformational Excellence because our state legislature is clamping down on anything DEI. But the work is still happening, so. Thank you so much, Amber. And I love this, like, I feel like a lot, when I talk to people in the world about, oh, we work with higher ed, the assumption is we must be working like current events, political science, like those kinds of things. And, and what you've heard is media studies, speech language pathology, a career center, a composition class. We have another one in Northern Illinois University where it's um, a food and the environment class. And one third of their class periods are a living room conversation. Um, so it has, you really, these, these the underlying skills um, just have so many different applications. I know I keep saying this, but I'm hoping that kind of hearing from these two and, and some of those snapshots kind of helps to do, like expand your understanding of how it can be used. So I'm gonna stop sharing the slides for a second and see if we have any questions. Um, for uh, for Amber or Catherine, or if there's any that I can answer based on what I know of how we've worked in higher ed, then I would love them. Uh, feel free to take yourself off camera or raise your digital or human hand uh, or drop it in the chat and we'll just kind of answer any questions that you have before you get to practice yourself. In the chat, um, Becca, someone asked, how often are new topics added? Um, so we are constantly um, revisiting our topics. So even the ones that are already there, we're looking to make sure that they're current and updating them. Um, we take a lot of input from our community. So if someone flags a guide for us, then we'll really look at it and try to make it better. Um, we also will do custom guides. So, you know, the one that we did for Amber's workshop, we had a whole series of guides on race and ethnicity. Um, and then we just tried to add the healthcare piece to it. So we do a lot of that um, consistently. And then it, it depends. So right now, you know, after October 7th, we were thinking like, what, what role do we have in kind of 
um, inviting people into a conversation. What is that conversation that needs to happen? And so we created this evergreen guide called Conversations in Troubled Times, where it's a reaction to current events. So, you know, even after the events of this weekend, like it could be used as, you know, how are you feeling about current events? Like, how is it impacting you? Um, how are you getting your neat news? Like on social media, we often just see who we follow, what experiences and voices are missing that could give you a better understanding of the topic. So um, we're in the past, I'm trying to think of in the past year, uh, a guide on persuasion, um, cancel culture has been fairly recent. Um, we had a guide on uh, being Asian American that came out post COVID, a whole series of guides uh, around race. So sometimes we'll get um, asked by our community, do you have a guide on this? And that can, that can create it. And then um, sometimes we have we have hosts, and I see Kat's got a good answer for this too. So we have hosts that are used to our model and they will sometimes say, you know what, I feel like we really need one on communicating with care or let's have one, our more curious, less furious guide or our empathy guide, where as they were practicing this, they said, these are really the skills and it might be nice to have a conversation around this skill that we're developing. Um, so it, it varies, but we're always looking for new ways. And, and as we identify um, things that we think people need to want to have a conversation around, we try to make sure we have those resources. Go ahead, Catherine. Oh, just um, listening to Amber share all the good she's done, you know, inspired by, you know, this model of living in conversations and um, it, it brings me back to, you know, the point, good points you're making brings me back to um, when I first started as a student participating and then later when, um, you know, Professor Curry had us um, conduct our own to, you know, to help um, people who um, might you know, have never done it before, like experience it as well. It showed me like, um, at, just from the student perspective, I can speak to the new topics added um, coming up, just like Becca was saying with current events is like, you know, how critical race theory was being discouraged of being included in the curriculum and, um, you know, and how, you know, of course, the people um, that care about not repeating cycles of harm, um, you know, want to include that. Um, my, you know, Professor Curry, um, um, she's just, you know, overall just so wonderful and, of, of course, very professional, but her personal experiences, you know, um, growing up uh, where she did, um, she was explaining that, you know, to us as, you know, on a human level, of course, but when she's a professor or her students and she's explaining, like, I have colleagues or um, good friends that are educators in the town I grew up in that are um, they will be legally, um, you know, reprimanded or um, punished for trying to teach anything that we all speak freely about here in our living room conversations and our cafe conversations. And um, so I was wondering, I want your input. I want your um, to add if this is something you want to discuss maybe in our next living room conversation. So sometimes new topics get you know, implemented or included that way when, you, you know, just like Becca referenced, you know, the events of this past week or, you know, that and and when someone is able to share their um, personal experiences um, that hit home so much like her and explain like, this is why it's so important because we're still able to have these conversations in this, you know, higher learning setting at our university, whereas, you know, people that I know and, and care about and, and, you know, that wish they could, um, can't. And, and so, um, it's just making such a great impact and just to see how, you know, LRC updates things and adds to their already helpful content, and then also listens to their community and listens to, you know, professors and students, um, you know, it, and makes us feel like heard and seen and, that's why I think it is so success successful because it's it's relevant, it's, it's true to life. And um, so, you know, just to add to that answer, like, and, you know, give us a specific example of how Professor Curry, um, you know, always like 
didn't just ask us to respect each other. She respected us enough to share what she was um, experiencing and to highlight the importance of why we were adding new topics. And, you know, it was like historical changes happening in real time. And this is how we can do our part to help. And thanks to Becca, you know, we could use living room conversations to guide us through. So um, that that's just something I wanted to add in as another way new topics might get added, you know, with feedback from the professors after it's implemented that way. And and another thing, you know, a very real and current example is after the um, violence that broke out at the rally for President Trump this weekend, we said, okay, what are the factors? Like, what could be at play? And so we were thinking of all the guides we currently have. We have a democracy, extremism, and outliers. We have a political peace building. We have a mental health guide. We have a guns and responsibility guide. We have a guide on hope. We're like, what do people need to hear and feel and be able to talk about? And so sometimes we'll we'll tap into the existing library and, and you know, we're doing a conversation on Friday where we're pulling questions from different guides that are responsive to as a rapid response to what's happening right now. So there are ways to to use and adapt the existing library if we don't have a specific guide on a really specific um, topic. And I see, do we have a network to share these guides? Um, not fully sure what you mean by network, but on our web page, there's a topics page and you can access any of our guides. So you just go and, and grab them and access them. Um, I do also kind of on, on the last um, slide here, I have a QR code to our higher ed page. And if you are interested in, in joining, you know, the, the group that that we gather and so we'll hear about programs like Amber's or some uh, we do a spotlight of a higher ed community and what are you learning and what are the challenges we will workshop some of those challenges together uh, as well. Thank you, Amber, for dropping that in the chat. We have another question. Go ahead, Gabriella. Hi, thank you so much, Amber and Kat for sharing. I have two questions. Um, Maybe the first one I'll, I'll direct to, to Amber and to Kat, and then maybe the second one could be to all three of you, including you, um, Becca. But my first question, um, Amber and Kathy, is uh, I, I know that it was mentioned, I think by you, uh, that silence is an important thing to bring to the table, right? Like that comfort with silence. But I'm wondering, in, in our space, this would be the first time trying any kind of conversation. And so living room conversation was uh, the format that we would like to go to as we start building kind of those the short bridges that were talked about. Um, any other advice that you have as we're getting started and as we're thinking about this as, as host, any other piece of advice that you think would be helpful as you were starting um, open to listening to that? And so just that was my first question. And then if you don't mind, I, the other, the second question, um, just in case, is if we do form part of this, Becca, I heard you say that there's been some assessment that's being done. Is there something that could benefit as we're integrating this about how we um, maybe evaluate what happened or surveys that would be helpful as we contribute and try to form a big picture? So I think one of them is other skills that would be helpful to know about <laughs> as we walk into this as host. And then kind of this more universal kind of assessment of how this is working, especially for institutions of higher education and how to start thinking about that to integrate it for something that we're looking to start um, anew this academic year. So I'll just quite dealt with that. Thanks. Sure. I'll, um, so some advice that I would give, and I'm thinking specifically to a conversation that I hosted um, on reproductive rights where um, I specifically, and, and, and some of the leaders at the Interfaith Center that I'm connected to, specifically reached out to the Students for Life group, because what I find is that oftentimes it's people who are sort of more left-leaning that tend to come to these conversations, especially in a college town, an academic setting. Um, and I just don't find those conversations as enjoyable as those where you have people who truly have different views. 
So one of the things that I would recommend if possible, and it can be challenging, is to find participants who you know will have um, views that are different from the kind of the usual people who come to the conversation. The other thing that I've started doing um, is I, I tell the attendees that the focus is not to reach consensus, that the focus is not to agree on anything. I, I tell them that in these polarized times, the fact that you can sit in a room with people who have different perspectives and talk to them for an hour and a half and even laugh sometimes and like find some things in common, like the fact that you can walk away and say, I just did that, like that's the victory, that's the thing. It's not agreeing with anyone. Um, there was a gentleman who came, he was a pastor from Indiana who came to the um, abortion um, conversation and I asked him how he found out about it. He said, well, his wife, I had sent the ad to different people in the community. His wife wanted him to get out of the house, said he needed to get out of the house more and said, um, you can go to this. And he came um, very conservative, kind of polar opposite to my perspective. But I see him in Kroger every once in a while. And like, it's a face that I now know and recognize. I say hi to him. He says hi to me. Um, it's hard to spend time having a conversation with someone and then not recognize their humanity when you see them elsewhere. I really think it is an important key to um, breaking down the silos that exist in our society. So, so that's that's what I would say is to let people know that the outcome and like the the win is simply that it, you did it. It's it's not that you agreed with anybody. And then for me, from a student perspective, I I really agree so much with what Amber shared. Um, but to and to build on um, her points about finding um, you know your humanity uh, together the the LRC model and the way that uh, Professor Curry um, implemented it with her uh, media done responsible responsibly um, Kathy conversations was to start with um, guiding questions as like icebreakers you know and so that kind of um, will help um, anyone who's participating find some kind of common ground and I think that builds a strong foundation for the beginning of entering, you know, these kind of difficult um, topics, or even if people are um, of differing um, backgrounds or points of view, um, but they all have the want to at least learn one new thing, you know, just um, you kind of, like she said, you, you know, you end up laughing oftentimes because someone will share a personal anecdote or because like Becca, um, you know, mentioned one of the questions we would also use is what would your best friend say about you? How would they describe you? And then, you know, some one time somebody shared something about how, you know, um, oh, they would say I'm the best basketball player they've ever seen. Just kidding. I'm not that great. But, you know, and they're just being silly, you know, and then someone else is like, I'm terrible at basketball too, but I love it. You know, like they just, their personalities come out and then you're kind of like seeing them as like a full person, not just their misinformed views or a, maybe a view you don't agree with. You're seeing them as someone that like you, you have a level of respect and care for. So it gives you a moment to pause and think maybe before you're going to say an answer and, you know, respond instead of react kind of thing and so if there's um if you um use the guiding questions that lrc um recommends or you know form your own after trying out um because sometimes you know they would switch it up the mdr team and um professor curry um just like how they switched up the topics sometimes are irrelevant to the times or or when they heard our feedback, what was needed, you know, like that we would like to discuss together. Um, they sh they would also change those questions um, based on the success of things. And like Amber noted, it is true. You know, you, none of us are going to ever 100% agree on everything. That's not the point. It's just to, you know, it's about progress, not perfection. And this is an excellent tool to make progress happen. And, you know, so... When there's that silence, um, 
I think, you, you know, just it, it'll it'll go um, more smoothly and, and the awkward silence will be less, you know, apparent or like present if, you know, everyone kind of starts with those really good icebreakers because this from, you know, participating, I just saw people open up instead of being closed up and tense, you know, and so that's just what I would encourage to do to, to get things started. And then that should help. And it's so nice that you're, you know, going to be doing this and I wish you all the best with it. I, I have a couple thoughts as well. I think one of them is to think about your, your why, like, what are your goals for doing it? Do you want to create more interpersonal connection on campus between students? Um, do you want to empower students to be student leaders? Like, so there are some things where, depending on what you're, what you're hoping for, like which department you're with or program or classroom that you may have different goals, and then just kind of have that drive it. And then the guide is pretty easy to adapt and plug into different circumstances uh, and then communicating that with the students up front, kind of how Amber mentioned, like, we're not looking for consensus. We're not trying to convince anyone. We're just trying to understand this, this topic through the lens of different experiences that you all have. Um, and then another thought kind of around the, the, diversity of experience within a conversation. Be there's a couple of things because the guides are, uh, the questions are designed to draw out personal experience. Even if you vote the same way and you think that, oh, we, we think the same on everything, you'll have different backstories for what brought you there. So you have a little bit of built in diversity into the conversation just because all humans are different and unique and their experiences are going to be different. Um, you know, Amber mentioned tapping student clubs. I think that's a fantastic idea. Like bring those in to get some of the, the diversity and involve people in the class. Um, one campus was doing a conversation on mental health and they worked with the neurodiversity club. And then they brought in, you know, like fidget toys for all of the tables. Like no one asked them to, they were just like, oh, we'd be excited to attend. And, and this is a good idea for you to bring in too. Um, and then I think another way that you can work around that is to think about what are the experiences or, or voices that need to be surfaced during this conversation. And if you don't think that you have that already baked in, you can do something like a panel. I mean, you have a ton of people on a campus where you can have different snapshots of an experience. You could have them model the conversation, or you could give everyone five minutes to say like, what does this topic look like? in your lived experience, like from where I stand in my professional capacity and my personal capacity, this is how I've experienced this topic. And this is what I wish others understood. This is what I wish the community understood. And so you could get some of those snapshots ahead of sending people into the smaller four to six person conversation. So there, um, there are a couple different ways that you can play with that um, to get what you would, what you're looking for out of a conversation. And then the other one that you mentioned was kind of um, the research. I'm happy to send anyone. We have one pagers on the research done on our topic. We have one pagers specific to higher ed that I'd be happy to give any of you those resources as you're trying to implement or look for funding as Amber suggests, um, I'd be happy to support in that. And then we also have um, you, there's a tool called the social cohesion impact measure that was developed by the Bridging Movement Align Alignment Council. So it's sort of a collective impact arm of the bridge building field and movement. Um, and it's free to use. It automatically visualizes the data that comes through. So you can do a pre post survey and then you'll see what impact you have immediately. You can add your own questions. You just choose um, three or four of the different metrics that they're testing um, and and you can put together the tool and it's a Google form and easy pre post survey. So those are some additional tools. It's called the social cohesion impact measure. Um, and I can send Laura that resource as well, maybe in a follow up email so that you get it. Um, and then I just want to double check with Laura. My understanding is this is a 90 minutes, right? I know we've had some people, yes, I figured some people minutes. would have to jump off top of the hour. And just in case Amber and Kat had to jump off, I figured we'd get them in there in the Q&A with them. But now we'll, um, 
we're ready to kind of move into actually just a really brief experience of the living room conversations model. Uh, we're going to do the social identity guide is a fantastic intro to this because it's 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 who are you so you're getting to know each other and you're building that connection but it's who are you in society so what groups do you belong to were you assigned to them um did you choose them how does that affect your self um image um has being a part of a group ever been a challenge or a benefit to you and what does that look like so that's the one that we'll kind of be going into um but uh, Laura gave a shout out to the conversation agreements in the chat, and these are them. These are the big six. Uh, you can see again how there's there's that shorter, just more memorable. Be curious and listen, understand. Be authentic and welcome that from other. Accompanied by a what does this actually look like, so that you're invited to kind of sit and think with them a little more. And something that I always do when I'm hosting a conversation is to um, kind of tee this up as yes. This is what's going to help you feel like you can share so that that safety of the conversation that structure of the conversation uh, we all have reasons we are avoiding conversations or don't feel like we can have them and a lot of it is um lack of confidence or skills that you think you need to do it as well as opportunity and so um these conversation agreements again i, I mentioned earlier they're they're actual skills that you're practicing during the conversation as well so as i read through them when i host conversations i'll invite people to think about which one comes really naturally to you which one might be a little bit more challenging maybe think of one that you want to work on during this conversation so that it's not just a list of rules that we're going to try and observe but it's something that you really want to practice and be aware of um and so let's just read these real quick. I may ask Laura, Kat, and Amber to help me. We can just kind of rotate through these. Um, and as we're reading them out loud, everyone else, if you kind of want to be thinking again of which one may come easy to you, which one do you struggle with, what's something that you'd like to work on in the very brief 10-minute breakout room that we're about to go to, where you'll have a chance to answer one question and be in conversation with two other people. I'll start. So I'll kick us. Okay, go ahead, Amber. Thank you. <laughs> Be curious and listen to understand. Conversation is as much about listening as it is about talking. You might enjoy exploring how others' experiences have shaped their values and perspectives. We'll do the next one. Show respect and suspend judgment. People tend to judge one another. Setting judgment aside opens you up to learning from others and makes them feel respected and appreciated. True to tr try to truly listen without interruption or crosstalk. Note any common ground as well as differences. Look for areas of agreement or shared values that may arise and take an interest in the differing beliefs and opinions of others. Be authentic and welcome that from others. Share what's important to you, speak from your experience, be considerate of others who are doing the same. Be purposeful and to the point. Do your best to keep your comments concise and relevant to the question you are answering. Be conscious of sharing airtime with other participants. Own and guide the conversation. Take responsibility for the quality of your participation and the conversation as a whole. Be proactive in getting yourself and others back on track if needed. Use an agreed upon signal like the timeout sign if you feel the agreements are not being honored. So those are our six conversation agreements. Sometimes I like to just sit with them for a little bit. If you if you can recall some of those topics that you mentioned, the conversations that you wanted to be having. Um, there was race, reproductive rights, voting, a lot of you know, kind of heavy issues. And sometimes when we think about dialogue, we think of it being heavy. Um, but these conversation agreements, when you think about what would it be like to be in a group where everyone's listening and recognizing that it's as much about listening as it is about talking, where we're willing to be authentic and share from our experience and welcome that from others, where we not only are looking for common ground, but we're appreciating the differences that we hear. 
and we're willing to try to set our judgment aside to suspend that judgment as best as we can and be respectful and just I like to just let people sit with that for a little bit like that's what we're headed into um is this ability to to have a different kind of conversation we all have bad conversation habits um we have you know things that we do that are less productive to having dialogue and this is a chance to try to practice approaching a conversation in a different way so this is our super abbreviated form <laughs> we'll have um is as you're in your breakout rooms that Laura's putting together for us, choose someone who can be a timekeeper. We mentioned silence before. We, I actually, you know, I'll have my phone and I'll give people two minutes and I'll give them a wrap it up signal when they need to wrap it up. But you know that you'll have a set amount of time to answer the question. So what we're going to do is you'll have someone agree to be the timekeeper and kind of help to move through the guide. Keep your conversation agreement in mind and really try to share from your experience. So think about personal experiences that you'd be willing to share. Everyone will have one minute to introduce yourself, your name, where you're from, something about something you love about your community. And then each person will have two minutes to answer one of these questions. You do not have to answer the same question. You can all answer different questions. Um, and just in case you're panicking on remembering all of this, I just dropped it in the chat. So you can follow along, um, you can bring it with you into your breakout room. So what the questions that you can choose from are either, which groups form your social identity? Which do you identify most with? Or which groups have you joined by choice? And to what groups are you ascribed by other people or society at large? How does this impact your self-concept? Or when have you benefited from belonging to a certain social group? When has it been a challenge for you? And so uh, as we're getting teleported into breakout rooms, maybe think about these questions a little bit, how you might answer them. Um, and then uh, Laura, Laura will send you on your way. You should have been invited to join a room. We're, we're nearly back. at time. Oh, go ahead, Laura. <laughs> no, nope, go ahead. We were both just eager to welcome you back is what was happening there. Um, <laughs> uh, I know we're almost at time. I would love just like really quick lightning reactions to the conversation, like something about the format or something that you learned. We can do reactions. We've got the digital reactions. Thanks, Emma. Um, Anything anyone wants to say out loud? We got more digital reactions. Perfect. I see a good from Jenna and some hand clapping. <laughs> so so hopefully it gives you a little taste for what it's like. Um, the the turn sharing and the timing can feel awkward, but overwhelmingly after a conversation, people really appreciate it. Um, just to not feel rushed to know that they have that time and they won't be interrupted. So um, that's something we always remind people of. It's it's without interruption. So you have the two minutes without interruption. Let everyone contribute and then we can kind of open it up. I see appreciation for the depth of the questions. Thank you. Um, I added in the chat a link to our higher ed page. It's It's a work in progress. We just launched a new website. So you won't see a lot of our case studies from higher ed that will be popping up. Um, and then I also included my email if you have any questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all being here. A special thank you to Amber and Kat for, for joining me and for sharing um, from their experience as well. And um, I'll turn it back to Laura if you have any kind of housekeeping things that you want to. Yeah, I just. I just want to say thank you, Becca, um, Amber, and Kat for being here. And um, we will go ahead and 
get this recording processed and um, get it posted up to the Campus Compact YouTube station. And um, we will send out any additional materials um, with follow up probably either late this week or early next week. So if there's anything that we at Campus Compact can do, please don't hesitate to go ahead and email me um, or get um, signed up on our um, email list. So thank you all for being with us and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks all.